All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Liberator podcast. We've got four people on set today. Of course, we've got James Silverman and Sam Riley, but also a special guest today, super excited about this, is Josh Malone, a.k.a. Lovejoy. Yeah. A.k.a. is the guy behind the guys. Josh Malone is actually the president of the board of free the states. Is that the right way to say it? Yeah. Basically I just try to make sure you don't break things. That's <laughs> yeah. my chief role in the whole thing. He, pl- he plays the role Crucial. of making sure that we don't break the law. Yeah. We don't offend all our viewers. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> we don't mismanage the money. He's just, he's a very important person in the whole free the states organization and has been around uh, the abolitionist movement from the absolute very beginning. It's been a long time. It's yeah. been a long, how long have I known you? Uh, 10 years, 12 years, 11 I years. I think it was 12. I think, I think it was 2008. 12 I think it was 2008. I uh, yep. started coming around Norman uh, to come to school. That's right. And I was in the Society of Christian Apologists and Philosophers. You were right? just nerdy you were, enough. You were Ian, like you had started that basically. The Ians, informed and not silent. Yep. Christians who are going to be doing Christian apologetics on yep. campus. And then it became SOCAP, Society right. of Christian Apologist Philosophers. Yep. And so I remember we were, uh, a lot of us were sitting in a coffee shop, uh, formerly known as Winans, uh, here in Norman. Michelangelo's. So, yep, now Michelangelo's. Not a sponsor. That's right. And then uh, <laughs> we basically were sitting around talking about, like, I think we are debating like open theism and like you're try, or trying to try yeah, to address open theism yeah, yeah, we're gonna as do a group. A, yeah. And, and, and a like, thing on open yeah, theism. Dismiss it, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, uh, you were like the weird guy who would just walk into the coffee shop, you know, kind of wave, say two or three sentences that were like extremely cryptic. And so like how has anything bizarro. changed? No, it's the same. <laughs> it's the same. <laughs> yeah. But I was, I was purposefully playing the Socrates role. Oh yeah. Corrupting the youth. Exactly. By getting them to be, yeah, I thought more Christian. Arguably, arguably, <laughs> no. But but it was funny because it was like I remember at that time your your art was on the walls of the coffee shop too at the time. Yeah, and so it was like probably literally that painting right there. Uh, was, yeah, that yeah, one's yeah. probably on there. Yeah, yeah. and it's like uh, can't sell it. Okay, this this guy's interesting. He's kind of weird. What uh, what? But part of it was you were in you. Ha- I think you were playing a more like secretive role. Because yeah, because at the university, you were in the university in pro- that program. Yeah. So probably like the following year, the next year, you were in courses that I was TAing. Yeah. So like the, f- uh, let's see, we, we got in all of no, that. So you got to understand. Yeah. Uh, Josh is a, is a super nerd, like a biochem <laughs> super nerd who thinks it's like fun to sit around and talk about complex specified oh, yeah. information and irreducible complexity. Like let's, let's meet at a coffee shop and talk about. Which protein we like best? Sort oh, yeah. of nerd. <laughs> I mean, which one's your favorite? Like, well, I mean, I like protein. Is it a bacterial folders, flagellum? You know, probably or ham. Overused bi- bacterial. That's true. I'd That's have true. to say. So what's the right answer? I'd have to say ham. Ham. <laughs> you like ham as your favorite protein? <laughs> Sausage. Wow. <laughs> how, how new covenant of you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no. Uh, the correct answer was ATP synthase. Yeah. yeah. ATP. Yes. Okay. Yes. And we're not going to go into any of that, but you got to understand that Josh and I's relationship predates uh, modern abolitionism. Uh, actually, it's what's funny is because I was a history of science uh, graduate student and Josh was a undergrad taking history of science. Did you do, do a minor? Yeah. I, history I, of science? Basically, I took the first class for fun and then I got sucked into it. Got minor. sucked yeah. in. Right. And so where a lot of this stuff actually happens there was a, uh, a dream course on the Darwinian revolution yep, yep. and it was awesome. Cause like I was the TA for the Darwinian revolution. Um, you know, so I'm like grading all the papers and, and, you know, doing all this stuff. And we had like Richard Dawkins as a guest teacher and all these people, oh, yeah. Michael Ruse. And I had this, this, this group of like four or five intelligent design <laughs> theorists. I was students. the president of the intelligent design and evolution awareness club on campus yeah. <laughs> and they knew that i was like this this christian evangelical like keeping his head down in the history of science i mean they, they knew i was a christian mm-hmm. but they didn't know that i was like you know friends. an id nut yeah they didn't know a, that a I proponent was like, an intelligent design proponent yeah <laughs> but so the whole thing is really cool we should you know go through that sometime but uh that's during that period and during that course, that's whenever I think the whole abolitionism thing started. Yeah. I remember I was, that book coming out like Pierre, like Pierre's the professor yeah. 
mentioned. Who in lives class. around the street from yep. me? I see him when I walk my dog. <laughs> That's great. Because I was like, "Hey, it's my student that got religion." <laughs> wow. <laughs> so. um, but yeah, I remember when he when he brought the book to class and he was like ta- describing Darwin's sacred cause. Right? It was like I forget the guys who wrote it, but it was like James Moore and Adri- Adrian Desmond. Adrian Desmond. That's right. Yep. And uh, it was like basically how uh, Darwin. By, by saying there was no more gradation between species, broke down the wall of like kinds, of like biblical kinds that yeah. had been erected between like white man and black man. It was like, yeah, like this is, no, you know, <laughs> like and this, this is like a nutty, nutty thesis. Like, and y'all know that I'm writing a dissertation going like, this is freaking nuts. <laughs> yeah. Well, but. speaking of uh, breaking walls, we should probably break, break a third oh, wall here and, uh, and redo our angle so we can get some good shots of Josh's face during this <laughs> discussion. Yeah. So, so anyway, but let, so yes, the, the port, the point of this particular episode is to get Josh on the podcast for the first time. But it's kind of a special episode because we're going to be talking to, uh, to Josh about his, his work and his role as a musician, uh, a.k.a. Lovejoy, um, and in particular, his uh, sort of writing, rewriting of the abolitionist hymn, Oh Holy Night. Um, so we're going to be going into that, why he wrote it and all that yep. kind of stuff. So yep. it's going to be a really good episode. Oh, yeah. And like the big goal is basically to get churches singing this song yeah. by mm-hmm. Christmas. Uh, For the same reason they used to sing it back exactly. when it was first written. Right. And so it's like trying to go through and explain everything with the song, what it means, what it is, and then uh, play it later on. Yep. Yeah. So let's do that. So yeah, Mr. Yeah. Lovejoy. I'm right here. I'm right here. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I don't know who I need to talk to if I need to like get with your manager or something like that and make a formal complaint, but... Uh, like for, for how much time and effort and energy was put into this set, a oh, beautiful set. It's great. This it doesn't even ha- have, it, it doesn't have a single picture. This is just Elijah how my office, loves joy. This is how my office just happened to look. <laughs> well, yeah. That's and great. we're like, let's film a podcast. <laughs> and I just had all this stuff. Oh, oh man. I'm really glad I had hung that on the wall. Yeah. I didn't if delay. You, if you've ever show. seen any of Russell's living spaces, it always looks immaculate. Like this. <laughs> yes. There's never that's any right. kind of very well. He's or, an extremely organizational person. Yeah. It just has to be yeah. perfect. Neat yeah. freak and everything. But yeah. no, there, there are, there are love joy books. They're books. There are Lovejoy They're books. books. Lovejoy is is very. I love him. He's a great abolitionist. But there's like only one illustration of him. Like you see pictures of like his printing press uh-huh. being burnt down, <laughs> and you see like sort of like cartoons and stuff like that. But there's not like there's there's all this stuff. So I will. The man I will remedy who destroyed this property was more painted than him. It's so sad. He was a martyr to his free speech, the, the freedom of the press, freedom of the press. Yeah. I will remedy it. I will get okay. some Lovejoy paraphernalia. Please do. Yep. One of these days, we should just go through the set and. You know, I don't know how anybody's going to know what I look like. So. Mm. Yeah. Well, I I I'm sorry, Josh. Talk to <laughs> yourself. Say- about remedying that. <laughs> but why did you call yourself Lovejoy? What's the... Yeah, so uh, we start kind of looking into all these different figures yeah. of abolition history and trying to reignite. You know, I, I remember you talking about a lot about Thomas Clarkson and about... Yeah, because it's the big ones. Every age has Clarkson, a evil, every age has an abolitionist, right? But uh, yeah, I don't even... So Elijah Lovejoy is known for being one of the big martyrs to the cause. Yeah. Like he built a printing press. Uh, he, was, he was a Presbyterian pastor in Alton, Illinois, built, built a printing press, yep. starts writing all this material that a whole lot of people, not Southern, he, w- he wasn't yeah. calling out Southern slaveholders. He was calling out Northern anti-slavery people. Yeah. And when he first started like in St. Louis, he was just, ge- just generally anti-slavery and he was also anti Catholicism. Mm. It's weird that anyone would do that. It's so counterproductive to attack people who agree with you, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, but the thing is, is Catholics were not like anti-slavery, yeah. especially in the area that he was at. But so he made a lot of people really angry yeah. in his area and they chased him out of St. Louis and he went across the Mississippi and then they chased him there and then they, they just kept on throwing his press. And Grabbing the press, throw it in the Mississippi. But yeah. he was a great guy and he became a Garrisonian immediatist mm-hmm. yep. and that just got him in more trouble. Yep. Um, so yeah, he, he's definitely, he's not the only martyr, right? Sure. But he's probably the most famous abolitionist martyr. And since he was actually like, you can look at the transcripts of what he was saying. He was like, he's like, I'm bringing the gospel to bear on this issue. Yep. He's actually a American Christian martyr. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but and, yep. And, and, and so basically like the last time it was like the third time they got a mob together 
you know, rounded him up to, to go come after his printing press. Mm-hmm. He, he, he stands in front of it and is like, no, like, you know, get out of here kind of thing. And instead of, you know, throwing his printing press in the river, they just shoot him five times in the chest. They throw him in the river. That's right. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. but there's, there, there are good books on it. And if you can get a hold of some of the stuff that he wrote, yep. he's a very poetic guy. He was yep. a, he was a preacher, um, but he was very poetic. And even though he wasn't sort of like a physical artist or a musician, yep. Um, he, he was kind of an artsy character. Yeah. So I always yeah. thought, man, he, he went with Lovejoy because it's a cool sounding name and he's kind yeah. of artsy fartsy like you. And we're just well, like him too, because our printer's always breaking here. Oh my gosh. Hey, <laughs> hey, <laughs> that's <laughs> true. Half the time. <laughs> Don't look at me on that. <laughs> yeah. The company yeah. we get that printer from must be pro-life. Oh my gosh. So, so yeah, no, but, um, it, it's interesting cause I, I started getting into writing music like the first song I figured out, I always played music, uh, you know, led worship, all kinds of different stuff in church. Yeah. And I really uh, wanted to write music. Couldn't figure out how finally understood why my lyrics were terrible. Like the poetry of the words and the rhythm and that yeah. kind of thing. Whenever I was writing a song to propose to my wife. Uh, and so anyway, after that, like the immediate pivot was, Oh, we could use this for abolition. Yeah. Cause that was the, <laughs> early, the early impulse, yeah. like the very beginning. And we've talked about this before. It was like, yep. we have to be engaging the culture at a, at a legit artistic yep. level to convert people's hearts and minds to abolitionism. And it's like, I was, use it as the Trojan horse to get, you yeah. know, like the CS Lewis line is, is stealing past, past the watchful dragons. Yeah. It's like, like, man, this is a really good song. Wait, yeah. what are they saying? Huh? <laughs> yeah. And so I think, I remember because I knew, so I knew you through the history of science stuff, yep. but then you're um, always playing your guitar and stuff. And you had started writing the song for Casey. Mm-hmm. And uh, was that, so you written what? Ri- had written one that song. one, had written another one about adoption uh, yeah. by the, at that time. And it, I was it was like awesome. abolitionist about adoption kind of thing. Yeah. And then uh, I remember, yeah, and it's like, it's, it's around this concept of like being visible for those who are not visible. Right. There's a lot, and this is a long discussion, but it's like there's a desire to to stay out of the limelight as Christians and like to not yeah don't get put your attention. works on display because mm-hmm. it's too and, which then def, like gives all the attention to the people who hate God yeah or and to like, get there right. to get there by pandering to them and then when you mm-hmm. get up on top somehow you're gonna be like oh wait I'm a strong Christian now I'm gonna right. tell you guys all the truth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and and it's weird because it's like now I'm in sales and marketing, whatever. It's like abolitionism has been marketing an idea from day one. And so mm-hmm. you're trying to figure out how do you get attention onto this thing? Well, sometimes that's by having to step into the limelight and be visible yeah. for those who are for not visible. Are not. Uh, it was a big early meme. Yeah, but, it was a very, yeah. it was an early thing. And I think I remember because I mean, I, you know, I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do. And we're, we got this little abolition society. Mm-hmm. What are we going to do? And I remember it was like trying to track down, you know, Dylan Chase and yep. his connections with the 116 click. Yep. Hey, can Sh- we show get Baraka? You, show, yeah. Videoing that, that, that. Getting show Baraka yeah. involved. Behind the camera. The, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. We, we wish we could have got him and uh, Tripoli and some of those guys yeah. more involved. But so trying to get artists and then it's kind of like, wait, but just Josh, you're an artist. Yeah. <laughs> like, why aren't you writing some abolitionist songs? Yeah. So you yeah. wrote the adoption one. Mm-hmm. And then I remember there was like one night that we were walking your dog, uh, Lilu, yeah. in the early days of Lilu, Lilu uh, around your neighborhood, just talk wow, about Lilu everything. Is old. Lilu oh, yeah. is old. Oh, yeah. Lilu yeah, is can't... like the age of the movement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have, a, I, have a, I have a stripy dog named Lilu, named, yes, after the fifth element character <laughs> that's orange and stripy. And yeah, I used to, these guys who were undergrads, would end up at my house um, and we just like sort of go on these long walks. I let my dog walk and uh, yep. yeah, we we're like off in, the, in a park somewhere. Yep. Yep. And we were night. talking about like Christmas and how really we needed to claim Christmas as an abolitionist holiday Yeah, and all the reasons why it's like the history and the today, like that's, yeah. we've got to make it so focused on abolitionist. Like it's, it should be an abolitionist yeah. holiday. And it was like right? the people yeah. who really made Christmas kind of the, yep. I mean, you can hate it, but the commercialization of Christmas, like mm-hmm. using Christmas as a means to sell things, to raise money, yep. that was the abolitionist yep. in America yep. and writing specific Christmas hymns and popularizing them. That was the abolitionist. So I think I was probably reading some of that stuff. Yep. And I was like, Josh, you should write 
some Christmas songs yep. because we need to, we need to basically like people are celebrating the incarnation once a year and you can't celebrate the incarnation and be okay with the culture of death. Yep. And so yep. once we kind of yep. discovered that we said, let's, I mean, for lack of a, let's like, like militarize right. Right. Uh, the Christmas holiday for well, the cause. And, and even why it makes so much sense. Right. And it's like, why it was all kind of clicking in place is like, I hadn't realized for a long time, I, I had been involved with uh, different pro-life ministries through our church and, you know, on campus and like all kinds of yeah. stuff for a couple of years at that point, you know, or b- even before the Abolition Society Norman yeah, was formed. like the JFA, CBR yep. type oh, things. Oh yeah, totally. And uh, so, but I, I didn't realize how central to our formal argument the incarnation of Christ is. Yeah. Because like in abolitionism, you have the, the two theological uh propositions right yeah, that's like foundational the, theological yeah. the things that make abortion so heinous right the and image it, of god and it like undergirds of all of our arguments right and it's like really this is way more heady intellectual of like this this these are the basis of why we do what we do and why yeah. we believe what we believe it's like yeah image of god uh and it's like uh we know who are we uh, commanded not to murder in Genesis nine? Yeah. It's image, image bearers. bearers yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's like the, the prohibition against murder is all who bear the image of God. And you will see that in pro life. Like yeah. they're made. In that's the image something of God, that gets talked about a lot. That's something that gets a lot of play and was already very much part of my vocabulary and my understanding, like yeah. even before all the abolitionist stuff started. Um, and so, but the incarnation of Christ doesn't get talked about nearly as often. Yeah. Because it, cause while the pro-life movement uh, is kind of also trying to be more general, secular, and open, image of God can kind of belong to everyone, you know, because it can kind of be at human least rights-ish. Broader, right. But then when you say, like, oh, how do we know that, like, life begins at conception and yep. human beings, when they are zygotes, are valuable image bearers? How oh, do yeah. we know that? What's the actual scriptural argument? It's not... God knew Jeremiah's name before he was, that's not even it. It's like, that's a, that's an art, that's an argument, right? But like the two smoking guns on it yeah. are number one, you have John the Baptist, yeah. right? Who, when, when fetal stage, John the Baptist, fetal stage, how, how many weeks did you say you calculated? What, I don't know. I don't want to go on record okay, because yeah. my math is so bad, but <laughs> I mean, he's definitely, he's definitely never trust Russ with numbers. He's, 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 he's after quickening. Like he's, I thought he's, it was six months. Because that's the the time that she got pregnant versus Mary. Yeah, so something yeah. like that. I mean, he was big enough th- that Elizabeth could feel him move. Yeah, yeah. But, but Jesus, he was recognizing Jesus in the womb, who was much younger, pre nine weeks, probably around nine weeks. Mm-hmm. Story so like embryonic stage. John the Baptist is older, like six months in the womb, kind of thing, or you know, but like his response when Mary approaches Elizabeth is to leap for joy in the yeah. womb, and yeah. uh, you know. And of course that's spiritual, but it's basically the Bible's making it very clear that the pre-incarnate or the incarnate Christ mm-hmm. is, you know, the prenatal incarnate Christ, right. excuse me, is there and is being there that they're right. somehow reacting. It's like to he's clearly another. he's clearly man. Yeah. He has clearly taken on flesh even at that nine week stage yeah. that John the Baptist is responding to. Which is yeah. like, wow, that's like, you know, pre all of these different like bills and stages and what, you know, like viability or yeah, you know, he, he can't feel, feel pain. pain. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, Jesus can't feel pain. Yeah. And mm-hmm. John the Baptist is flipping in the womb. It's like, <laughs> it's, yeah. Well, and, yeah. and, and even before that, just if you think about it, it's like Gabriel tells Mary that she's going to be with child. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so Mary, however young she is, 14, yep. 15, whatever age she is, you can't just sort of like have, you know, a nine week or a, a pain, a, a pain capable or a heartbeat bearing, uh, fetus pop into your, oh, yeah. that would kill you. Right. It has to be sort yep. of like conceived yep. by the Holy spirit within her womb. So we're talking exactly. pre-implantation exactly. incarnate, like the son of God, the creator of the cosmos. So it was like, it was one of these mind blowing things where like the creator of the cosmos, the greatest, biggest thing becomes oh, yeah. the size of a single human cell. Oh yeah. Floats mm-hmm. down the like fallopian embryonic tubes. Jesus in the fallopian tubes. You know, there, there's a line I have in another song of like God in eight cells. How can this be? Yeah, yeah. and when, the, the the interesting thing I think when you look at the the, the pro abortion arguments that they'll make, they'll say things like it's just like a bundle of cells. It's just eight cells. That the significance of that is so much greater when you're talking about the God of the universe oh, yeah. entering into the womb at this stage. Yeah, um, yeah. which is he's like us in all things. Yeah, even that yeah. earliest little like and that yeah. is when and that's the most dangerous place on the planet like 
that the human the human condition after the fall is such yeah. that human beings, when we're conceived, there's a very high likelihood that we do not make it yeah. because mm-hmm. of the the fallenness of our biological systems. Yeah. And so that Christ is in that area too. Yeah. Like so so I remember early on just and he my, was hunted at that stage too. Yeah. And and that's and and when you think about what, you know, Satan or the demons or whatever are like oh, yeah. so opposed to now it's children at any stage. Yep. And mm-hmm. that's why the preponderance of the creation of chemicals that will kill human beings, image bearers in the place of the incarnation before right. they're even implanted. And so I think that we were thinking about yeah. what are the implications of the, all this? Yeah. Cause the question that, that really lays the foundation for like, when does human life begin is like, well, what stage did Christ take on human flesh? Yeah. Did he like, you know, to hearken back to our, Darwinian, you know, yeah. ontology recapitulates phylog- phylogeny. Did he go like through a, a fish stage? Would, would did Jesus show stage? up as a fish first and then a bird and then he was a human? Uh, <laughs> it's like, no, he entered the womb. Yeah. Ernst Haeckel nonsense. And, and was, was conceived and implanted into her womb as a human being. Yeah. And fully so, human. Fully human. Though not in any way, shape, or form looking like a cute little baby that would end up like on a pro-life yep. billboard. Yep. Like, mm-hmm. like little circles, right? Circles oh, yeah. and circles. And, and everybody like the, in, at Christmas time, when we talk about the incarnation, what does it look like for God to take on flesh? Right. What does it look like for, you know, Emmanuel to finally come? Like mm-hmm. we think about baby in a manger. That's the entire conversation is about the baby in the manger, which yeah. don't get me wrong. That had its own cool elements and is awesome too. It right. Did. Yeah. But, totally. but when did he become man? Yeah, no, as an embryo that Mm -hmm. I remember. So J J I Packer, great Mm -hmm. book, knowing God. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of one of these books that I would kind of revisit. And after I became an abolitionist and I was revisiting knowing God and I read the chapter on the incarnation and, uh, there's this thing about like, think about it, like God, very God in a manger. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I mean, yeah, but God, very God, like, in a fallopian tube. Like, dude, it's like, you're miss you're missing the implications of <laughs> I, this. And I remember thinking, wow. And if we start preaching and talking about this, it's going to have implications for birth controls. It's going to have implications for in vitro fertilization. It's going to just blow this whole thing up. And, and then I started kind of, maybe people don't talk about, you know, Christ in the womb in certain ways and more it's Christ in the manger because they're trying to avoid the implications. Yeah. And, I, and I, yeah. the, one of the first posters I made, it's like, and the word became flesh. And then it's, it was like a zygote probably two or three days yep. after conception. And so I'm like, the word became flesh. Isn't the word became this sort of like giggling, dribbling baby boy. It was the word became flesh, like the way that we all become flesh. Yep. And uh, so we're out walking in the park. Yep. It's kind of like, man, we got to, we got to get some songs Let's about do this, this, man. We're getting excited. <laughs> like, cause it's, it's a little heady and yep. we're always saying abortion takes place. It kills an image bearer and a neighbor in the place of the incarnation. Yep. And I think that goes over people's heads. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I think I remember saying, Josh, is there any way maybe you can yep. get this? And, and, well, song? and before we, before we go there, it's like, and that was in imitation of the abolitionists of slavery. Yeah. The icon that they used over and over and over again right. was the "Am I not a man and a brother?" symbol. Yep. And that symbol and the 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 words behind that symbol, yeah, were directly connected to the theological propositions they all adhered to. Am I not a man made in the image of Christ, of God and, and a, brother. a brother redeemed by the same Savior? Yeah, so it was literally like gospel image of God incarnation of, of Christ. Like those were both. Yeah, and very important at the beginning too. Like I, we we talk about all the things that are on the set, but I. It's on the set. We just don't have it in the angle. But yeah, everyone's seen that am I not a man and a brother thing. Yeah. Yep. And I remember like Greg Cunningham of all people were like, this is a graphic image. And I'm like, it's not a graphic image. That was a romantic symbol. Cause I, cause I did some yeah. art history. Yeah. It's like, it was a romantic symbol yep. and it was meant to track with other believers, image of God, incarnation exactly. of Christ, man and a brother. Oh Yeah. And uh, so whenever we had sort of like the AHA thing, that's why you had the two eyes. The H H was also. The H is two eyes. Humans are important because these two eyes. And uh, yeah, I was kind of like, yeah, we need to do what they're doing. Use symbols, use art, get it out there. But it's still hard in the midst of all sort of this pro-life narrative um, that that I do remember was like, we need to really, especially around Christmas when people are 
uh, getting into this. We really need to to get the incarnation front and center. Yeah. Mm. As the, uh, as, you know, I think we started saying even way back at the beginning, it's the death knell to all arguments. Oh, yeah. You know, for abortion. It is, it is one of the clearest moments in our calendar where you can see, like, the conflict between, like, God and the work that he's doing in the yeah. world and Satan and the work that he's doing in the world. And it's, like, through all stages of, of his life and, and you know, everything. But it's, like, right now Satan is so vehemently attacking, yeah. like, the inside the womb, yeah, you know, and, Jesus. <laughs> and, and, and every year you have all these people who are, you know, straight up secular humanist atheist type people to nominal Christians, to hardcore Christians, the whole gamut, everyone singing nativity hymns yep. or nativity songs. And all these songs that they're singing are so radically opposed to the culture of death. Yep. It's kind of like, man, if we can get people to realize that when they are singing something like, oh, holy night or silent night or any of these songs, they are singing songs yep. that are in conflict with what they seemingly seem to either tolerate or ignore or even be okay with. Mm -hmm. So you cannot celebrate the incarnation of Christ and be pro child sacrifice at the right. same time. Right. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to bring all that um, to the, f you know, forefront of our yep. arguments so that maybe we could gain some people to the cause. Yep. yep. So that's where Oh Holy Night comes yeah. into it. Yeah. And so like, I think like in the following week we were kicking around different ideas and, and ended up, I don't even remember how, yeah. but settling on Oh Holy Night is a pretty good option. Because... And like, the farther we dug into it, the more sense it made. But, and, the, but the original readings, Oh Holy Night was, in the 19th century, yep. written by an abolitionist. And it had that verse. We all it, sing it. It was a, it was a flagrantly, I'll, I'll put it in square, square quotes, political yes. song. It's really like... All these issues are love your neighbor issues, not like that have a political prong. Yeah, but it was a this controversial isn't like a political issue. But issue, it was a controversial issue that would have been tearing families apart. Like yeah. literally, when it gets translated into uh, English, is in 1855, and so when, when you think about like that, the context, slave is our brother being sung. The slave chains shall he break for the slave is our brother. A poetic way of Am saying. Am I not a man and a brother? Because Jesus came and is who he says he was. The slave is going to be we, set free. We have to stop slavery because yeah. Jesus. There's neither slot. There's neither slave. Because nor Christ, free Christ, Christ is the Lord. He's the master, not these human lords and these human masters. Yeah. It's like he frees us from our chains so that we serve him as Lord. Is like yep. how that third verse goes. Yeah. Even though <laughs> the original writing of the third verse in French. Was more but, hardcore. Even like after I said, the being, deeper you go, the more you, interesting the whole thing is. Yeah, so we should go so, into that. But yeah, yeah. So by the time it came out, it was still being sung. Like there, when Oh Holy Night was put out, there would be people in America going like, "Oh, I'm not singing that song." Oh yeah. Like, oh, but yeah. now Celine Dion is like singing it on the radio without even thinking about it yep. being such a gospel against evil right. sort of song. Right, because of course everybody accepts that now. Yeah. But it's like everyone no, pretends no, 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 no. like they'd be remember that it was a very controversial thing. And like brothers like fired guns at brothers yeah. over whether or not the slaves should be freed. Yeah. And so it's like it was extremely like heart wrenching in that moment in history. Yeah. But as you have people like stepping up and singing about it, like this is yeah. we, you know, plan our flag here. Might be controversial here. still yeah. among some people, unfortunately. <laughs> but the idea was that the gospel was designed to destroy yeah. things like chattel slavery. Right. And that song is putting it in there. Yeah. Or the, the kingship of Christ demands it. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, so, so the original though. Yeah. Uh, the original uh, was uh, written in French, got translated into English by a, uh, you know, transcendentalist. Yeah, a guy coming guy. along in 1855. He was like, like a late Bostonian 18... Yeah, like, he's like, right. abolition's getting popular. It's 1855. We're all abolitionists now. We used to burn down their buildings and tar and feather them, right. but now right. there's some money in this. And so it's like out. after 30 years of the movement, this guy comes along and is like, well, I don't believe anything about Jesus, but uh, <laughs> I mean, not, yeah. not orthodox. Yeah, he's some yeah. kind of deist, right. Unitarian or something like that. And, and you see that even in how he translates it. Yeah. Because mm. uh, basically, if you look at the first verse... Um, you know, I know it's one of those, um, 
Everybody loves this image that's put forward. Of the oh holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It, it is, is the like, night of our dear Savior's birth. That's good. That's a good piece. Ah, uh, but the long the, lay the, the stars world are in shining, sin and corny. error, pining as though we're the victims of sin instead of like mm. the committers of sin. Yeah. Uh, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth as though like we need, we need <laughs> self worth. And that's why if, that's we, if why only gotta, we felt valuable, then we wouldn't sin. You got a hashtag love yourself. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's like, it's like <laughs> yeah. Joel Osteen had somehow <laughs> <That's right. laughs> found an audience, but uh, that's why I think secularists can sing it today. Cause I it's know. like the soul felt its worth. Oh yeah. yeah. Ooh. And, and so it's like, it's Oh weird. night divine. Oh, oh night. Night like what divine. the night was divine? Like I thought Jesus was divine yeah. and he was the king over all. So so you're looking so, at these lyrics and you're like, I don't oh, yeah. think these lyrics really track with what Hear I know the about. Angel voices. Yeah, abolitionist. This, right. And so you right. go, Oh, it's a translation yeah. of an earlier French so, abolitionist. So let's read the literal English translation. This is the one according to uh Wikipedia. I did do a little bit of Google Translate work and I talked to uh, abolitionist, longtime abolitionist, Alan Maracle, who knows, knows French, French yeah. who, to help make sure I didn't screw stuff up on it. But it was like, here's the what the actual language was. Midnight Christians, it is a solemn hour when God as man descended unto us. So yeah. already you're dealing with Christological it, truth right there. Hypostatic union, whatever. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to erase the stain of original sin. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. That and to through. end the wrath of his father. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, propitiation's right there. Yeah. Like, that's weird. <laughs> wait, wait. Uh, we're worthy? We are worthy? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Um, the entire world thrills with hope on oh. this night that gives its savior. Yeah. So he, he kind of took that one line. Yeah. The thrill of hope. Um, but it's like, because the savior is is being the wrath-bearing sacrifice on behalf yeah. of our Yeah. So it's just like this right. super awesome, orthodox, oh, yeah. biblical gospel yeah. thing. Oh yeah, yeah. And he kind of he waters it down. He gets little parts of it, but that's where all that corny stuff about shining stars and yeah, oh, yeah souls yeah. having hope come in. And don't get me wrong, if I was picking, you know, I I do think I like his version of the third verse better. Uh, you know, it's like even more explicitly, uh, you know, yeah. in the abolitionist lingo and verbiage. Yeah, which is probably why right. he did it. He was right. making a political statement, but it was still clear where it's like he sees a brother where there was only a slave. Love unites those whom iron had chained. It's like, mm-hmm. that's what the original French said and why everybody was singing it so much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. because they were looking at biblical passages yeah. and they were looking at the New Testament is written by slaves, two slaves, and they're all being made brothers of one blood and all this kind of stuff. Right. And, and the wall between that. the Gentiles and the Jews was broken down of like yeah. anyone who was in the class that wasn't the slave. It's like, no, we can yeah. all... So there's a lot of double B1. meaning going on. Right. But yeah. yeah, in the translation, John Sullivan's, the truly he taught us to love one another... His law is love and his gospel is peace. This isn't bad. Chain shall he break for the slave is our brother. That comes, he sees a brother where there was only a slave. Right. right. So it's, it's, it's a pretty faithful and I think yeah. maybe poetically. And sounds like the abolitionist slogans. Yeah. Like that's what mm-hmm. it is. And I think that's what happened is like he's in this culture that has this abolitionist messaging. He's translating this thing because it's popular in the anti-slavery circles. And he translates it in light, like at that verse in light of how, yeah. The abolitionist message. But when it came to the Christology, totally this, ripped this out. particular guy couldn't stomach that. So oh, he, yeah. he downplayed it. You still right. have the night, you have the night being divine. So I mean, <laughs> no, that's right. It's like, instead of the God man has descended to earth, it's like <laughs> the night was divine. And the stars were very pretty. <laughs> the it's stars like, were brightly shining. That's right. But which in a sense, you know, I mean, there's an acknowledgement that something divine is going on. Sure, but sure. Oh yeah, but, but like I mean, I do like the long lay the world in sin and error pining. That is factual. Yeah, but it also but makes it's different victims. than like, it's again, different. The, than, the language in the original is like so clearly like we are the ones who have done something that he's coming to fix. Yeah, can so, you imagine yeah. Celine Dion or Mariah Carey saying? Uh, to erase the stain of original sin. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope to basically make that happen here. So, soon. <laughs> so we're thinking about all that and we're kind of like, okay, one awesome abolitionist him. We've gone back and looked at this original French abolitionist, uh, Placide Capot and his work. And we're like, man, this is awesome. Why not add a verse about the evil of our age? Right. Right. Like, can we, we have a, a verse that's, kind of remained in our culture yep. against the um, evil of chattel slavery. Right. But what about 
the evil of child sacrifice. Right, because that's abortion. why it was written in the first place. It's very much in line with the spirit of like what the song was, why it became popular, yeah. why it was mm. something that mattered in our society. So it's like, and so it's like, all right, this is yeah. a great one to do that with. Yeah, the same thing we yeah. did. We said reignite the abolitionist movement against right. slavery for abortion. Let's reignite some of these. Let's hymns. make a holy night political again. How's mm. that? <laughs> make a holy night hard. For people to sing again. What's the acronym for that? Yeah. (laughs) Not MAGA. But like, yeah. Make, I mean, I remember thinking that. It's like, let's make it impossible for like someone who hates Christ to sing Oh Holy Night. Mm -hmm. How would you do that? Oh, well, just bring the gospel into conflict with abortion and use the incarnation and you're going to see all these people. Now, I thought, man, let's do this and let's get all these Christians singing it across the culture. Now, we didn't really know that from the side, people would be sort of saying that we're a bunch of bad people. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so it didn't catch on. But one of the reasons we want to have this program now is because we want people to look at the work that you did Mm -hmm. in updating the song and start getting abolitionists, getting churches that are abolitionists, Christians who are abolitionists, to start singing the correct version of O Holy Night that's more accurate to the original well, and it's and more ac- accurate first. to Christ. It's like, yeah. this was a conscious effort to root what we do in abolitionism in the theology of Christ yeah, and in who we, our identity in Christ yeah, and uh, like be a thing that becomes an anthem for us to sing together. <laughs> you guys are acting like everything has to be about Jesus. <laughs> it should <laughs> right? well, Everything is, and it should be. <laughs> but like, and, and there was another thing that uh, because of historical revisionism, and all the stuff that happened in Reconstruction and post-Reconstruction all the way up to our day, it, a lot of the fact that a lot of these hardcore um, abolitionists of slavery were very serious followers of Christ. Mm. Mm-hmm. But what happened is is the people who wrote the histories sort of wanted to downplay that mm-hmm. and claim them for you know, humanism and stuff. And then there were abolitionists of slavery who were Unitarians. There were some abolitionists who were Universalist and stuff. And there's this mixed stuff. So what ends up happening is you have these historians making out the abolition of slavery movement as though it were not Christian. Right. But then if you really look at their letters and their sermons and oh, their yeah. songs. Read Wilberforce, read Garrison. They read are Her- yeah. highly yeah. biblical. Oh, and yeah. and so, so I think there was that was an impulse too. Right. It's like, let's rehabilitate. People shouldn't look at John Sullivan's version of Holy Night. They should look at Placide's. And they, they shouldn't. Look at, and so I think we were cognizant that some people were attacking us and calling us non Christians just because we thought abortion was such a, a sin that the church should deal with. Yeah. And we wanted to make sure that, like, 30 years down the line, say after we've abolished abortion, that historians in the future didn't look back and say, oh, well, yeah, I mean, look at T. Russ and Josh, and those guys aren't really Christian. They're just kind of using some Christian language. And I didn't want them doing to us what historians had done to. You know, guys like Lovejoy. I mean, Lovejoy is yeah. five point Calvinist Presbyterian preacher. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have nowadays, it's like you, you have a lot of people that just want to be human rights activists type things and they don't want to be explicitly Christian, even like abolitionists or anything like that. They want to distance themselves from all of that. Yeah. And so the need to like stamp Christ's name on everything we do is needed right now because yeah. it's like there's. Well, well, that's the point. You have to be flagrant. Like, that's yeah. literally like. Literally, that's the point. Yeah. Like, we are bringing the gospel into conflict with our culture for the sake of revival and redemption yeah. of the culture through addressing the evil of our age. And the same people who are throwing those attacks, like, uh, you guys aren't, you know, preaching the gospel and stuff like that, and that's what we need to be focusing on and not talking about abortion. It's like they're the people that are oftentimes the ones that are just like human rights activists in this regard or something like yeah. that. And share those kind of memes and stuff like that, but never yeah. make it about Christ when right. they go or about fighting abortion. They'll they'll be very opposed to us because we're not keeping the main thing the main thing in their view. Yeah, and, and then they'll side with like forty days for life or something like that. Yeah, who and, literally removes the main thing from their thing? Like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, but it's so yeah. it's a it's a crazy yeah. Oh, yeah. mess. But I think that mess was something that's kind of like, listen, I don't want my grandchildren to think that I was some kind of you know, person not motivated by a love for my neighbor out of a love for God. Right. And I don't want them to think that, you know, that the gospel wasn't central. And I'd seen that it didn't matter if Garrison wrote a letter to someone and said, I I like what you wrote here, but it's devoid of 
biblical pungency mm. or it's devoid of the gospel truth. And I know that a historian today goes, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to publish that letter and remove those pieces. <laughs> or yeah. Garrison's like, you know, sometimes you got to stand against the Bible for the Bible, like Wycliffe and Luther and those guys, because people misuse the Bible. And then people will pull these little quotes. And so I'm like, man, Garrison was sometimes reckless mm -hmm. in what he said. So I'm like, I want to be very upfront, gospel centered, yep. incarnation of Christ, image of God. We are, we are redeemed people who are left here to fight to bring the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, not just sort of like that you can be saved. Oh, yeah. But what mm -hmm. the relevancy of those passages in Isaiah right. about how the government shall be on his shoulders. Oh, yeah. Like, let's bring that. I mean, Isaiah oh, yeah. is good, but haven't you ever heard of Sled, Russell? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> That's so good. Well, yeah. well, no, the people who would persecute us for not being Christian enough be like, go listen to this guy. And he's like, <laughs> Sled. And right. like, not that slide doesn't have its place. It can be used, but it's like if you don't have the gospel, the image of the image of God in man, it's like you don't have the yeah. power. Yeah. yeah. Like the you don't have the thing that you have to have right. to actually get people to convert to your position that condemns them. Yeah. Because they have to like have redemption or else they're not yeah. going to convert to your position. Right. Yeah. Side note, because we'll never do a whole thing on it, but sled applies to like dog embryos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there's, there's nothing like, uniquely human size about it. Yeah. level. I mean, it's, it's like, there's nothing you need the image of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you abortion, need, the you need yeah. if for abolition, you need murder should be prohibited because they're image bearers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And why would we work this hard? Well, if you think about it, God loved man so much that even when man went away and destroyed that image or marred that image, he decided to come down among us to restore it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that value that God has for humans is what is motivating mm -hmm. abolitionists mm -hmm. in, in everything we do. Oh yeah. yeah. And, and, and to, to piggyback on some of what you were saying of like the whole, like the gospel, you know, what I, part of why I got into abortion ministry was like, I show up on campus I'm trying to engage like Christian, like apologetics, trying to like figure out how do you, how do you go to the darkest place you can? go and, and try to actually speak directly to the atheist and deal with their argument. Mm -hmm. And like, how, how do you handle that and respond to that? Well, how, how do you do that in a way that actually like leads to their repentance and leads to them like coming to a knowledge like, yeah. of Christ? Yeah. And uh, what I like, th and this is a weird long discussion, but it's like, if you don't talk about their sin, Mm -hmm. You never can offer them a savior, like period. Yeah, and if yeah. they and if they don't, they don't confess their sin, repent of their sin, and become oh, yeah. indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it doesn't matter if they're going to buy into the biological information that that human beings are human from the moment of conception. Right. Yeah, they will still murder their child, right? Because their self is still on the throne. Yep. And so, and, and so, I actually in personal evangelism saw how powerful uh, the just leading with a sin was. Oh, like yeah. talking about abortion and then like how quickly you get to the gospel. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. And, and the, like, and the lost person will usually go there really quick. I know. Mm. And They'd the, rather talk about the gospel than that. <laughs> I know. But the, yeah, I know. Cause they're yeah. like, they, they're like, Oh, you're just a Jesus freak. Yeah. And that's when you go, yes, he yeah. exactly. my soul. Right. But like, well, and I, I, well, I think like to the, to the Christian, at least the more sanctified I became, the more uninteresting facts became apart from how they related to my Lord. Mm -hmm. Like, what, what, where do I see Jesus in any of this? Mm -hmm. How can I look at this and see the Christian worldview behind all of it? Like yeah. economics, I loved economics as a kid when I was reading this stuff. But then the more I looked into the Christian worldview, it's like, oh, wow, a Trinitarian God is the only thing that makes sense of working economic systems. Yeah. You know, so it's like facts like these, like the incarnation, how does it relate to abortion? That's not interesting to me anymore unless yeah. I can figure out where Jesus is in any well, of it. Well, you gotta, and, you know, yeah. And you really what, some of it as just general knowledge, yeah. but it's not, it's not even controversial. Yeah. Like the science isn't controversial. Right. And right, if you find right. yourself on a college campus debating like when life begins, like yeah. you are wasting your time. Yeah. The only reason that that person is saying something as idiotic as life begins at like breath or something like that yeah. is because they're trying to suppress the truth that life yeah. begins at conception, that is a truth with unrighteousness because they're trying to suppress the greater truth yeah. that they are a sinner mm. before God because, oh, yeah. they, because they love the, the dark and they hate the light. Oh, yeah. 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 And, 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 and people, go there. That's people, why people are killing their children. Christians get this twisted when it's like, oh, but I don't want to just go like 
be preaching like a, a Judaizer gospel or like a law gospel. Like, in, 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 I, I want to be preaching the gospel, preaching grace, like all this kind of stuff. Um, and <laughs> what we miss like so much is like Christ is not Jesus's last name. It's not like you had <laughs> Joseph Christ <laughs> who adopted him. You know, and it was like, and then he became Jesus Christ. How providential and fortunate was that <laughs> Joseph amazing. Christ had yeah. Jesus. It's like, which is like such a normal word. Like half the people, it's like, yeah. it's like so having when, a name like Josh. I know, I know. <laughs> and so when you show up to or like James or Sam, if for that matter, <laughs> very common name. Jesus you guys are so boring. Russell now. Okay, <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. That's, that's so good. That's T Russell. All right. <laughs> Um, yeah, but, but when you get to these texts, like first Corinthians 15, it's like the King has died. Like it's always about Christ. Yep. Died. Messiah. The anointed one, the Messiah, Messiah the long awaited promise foretold. Like there's all these texts that explain who he is, what he's coming to do, like what his kingdom is going to be like on the throne of David, yeah. like all this stuff, like an acts. All the way back about, yeah. And to so the proto evangelum, whenever it's, like, it's basically about a, the seed of woman. Cr- mm. will come crushing the, head of the crushing the head of the serpent. Oh yeah. And so you like when you miss his kingship demands on the souls of men, you completely miss who Christ is in history, who yeah. Christ is in like an individual's soul. And so when you walk out and you say like, here's his standard, you must adhere to it. That's preaching the gospel. Yeah. Because you're announcing the good news that the King has come. He has these demands. You've conflicted with them. He has laid down his life so you could be redeemed, but you had better bow the knee. Yeah. And I, I know we can't make this the point of the whole episode or whatever, but uh, it, like if anybody's out there wondering like, well, what are you talking about? That sounds so like against what like the gospel of grace, whatever is when, yeah. when in Luke nine, Christ is sending out the apostles. Like what he, what he says is like, he sends them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Right. And he yep. tells them how to do it. And then, at the end of it, it says, and they departed and went through the villages preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Yeah. So mm-hmm. proclaiming the kingdom of God, the idea that like proclaiming the kingdom of God is not preaching the gospel right. is like so twisted. In it's Christian a modern, culture a lot it's of times. a modern problem. Right. People yeah, think right. that you're just running around talking about substitutionary atonement, which is super important. Totally. But the thing is, it is the doorway. It yeah. is the way you enter into the kingdom of God justly. Yeah. If you look at the yeah. earliest gospel, you look at like Mark, it's like, and Jesus came on the scene preaching, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. Absolutely. And Jesus obviously preached the gospel. He, right? <laughs> if we could, you know, Jesus, you, you got a life, death and resurrection of Jesus. Like oh, well, yeah. Jesus came on the scene preaching the gospel right. of the kingdom, that he was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Right. And uh, yeah, and I think that a lot of people miss that yep. today. But, um, but you were going somewhere with it. So for me, like going around and, and doing abortion ministry where you're addressing sin is totally in line with preaching the gospel. Like yeah. a desire to evangelize is so hand in hand, like yeah. with the commands of like, you, you have to bow the knee. If you don't talk about the sin, you, d- you never actually t- preach the gospel. Yeah. And I remember there would be different people, uh, you know, I'd see it like in the appendices of a book by some prominent pro-life yep. teacher or like in the training manuals of like the CBRs and the s- stuff like that, where it's kind of like, don't answer, don't give a theological answer unless they ask a theological question. Right. Or don't, you know, don't lead with the God. And I was always looking at that thinking, that's so weird. Mm-hmm. It's like you're there talking about like whether or not people can kill their their babies, right. which is obviously like this sin, and the answer to sin is the gospel, and they're in the middle of this sort of like really heady conversation about you know right and wrong and ultimate foundations, right. and, oh, and, yeah. and you've got these leaders saying you know you kind of want to leave that out. Yep, um, you, you can get to it, and I'm like, how do you not get to it? Right. Mm -hmm. Because the whole point, like when you're doing that kind of evangelism is very Schaeferian, whatever. It's like you're doing comparative worldviews. Well, if you never talk about your worldview and you only try to like make your argument within their world, that's the false world. Like, how do you ever get to what's true? It's definitely not the rich young ruler contrast that (laughs) Jesus brings up, like leave everything behind and come follow me. Exactly. No, you'll become a richer young ruler. Yeah, that's really yeah. the message of ev- a lot of evangelicalism yeah. nowadays. Yeah, what, what you were talking about, Russell, with the kind of the the leaders coming down and saying, "No, like make it about abortion and not about the gospel," like that. Yeah. that happened to Sam in a pro life group that uh, he used to be with. Um, you know, Sam talked about earlier on this podcast. Right. He was talking about as he kind of got more sanctified. Um, 
as he as he was becoming more growing in sanctification, growing in <laughs> sanctification, um, he would make the conversations just naturally went to the gospel more quickly, mm-hmm. and that was something he got conf- confronted on because it was like, well, why are you making it all about the gospel? We're trying to change minds on abortion, like yeah, um, to tone down the gospel. Yeah, part and of there's it. a sense how how do you even change a mind on abortion yeah. without the gospel? Yeah, well, that's what I was realizing. Like it became easier when it was when it was uh, the the framework was all around well. The Christian worldview is the only thing that makes sense of human equality or human worth in any capacity. You yeah. can't make sense of why someone shouldn't kill you right now in your worldview. Yeah. Christianity can because thou shalt not murder, but you don't have that divine commandment. And so in conversations with people on campus, this is so much easier to present to someone because it actually is consistent and it's truthful and it makes sense of the underlying presuppositions that they already have easier and more effective. But the other thing is like the pro-life side (laughs) is like, it's actually not uh, attacking their presuppositions because their presuppositions are destructive of everything you're trying to do. They say you're basically, you know, meat, you're nothing, you're not important. And why would a human child be important if you're not? Yeah. If it's like utility or usefulness or something, there's, I mean, you're just a bag of selfish genes. That's all you got. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. like the whole like finding common ground thing, which it seems like this good thing, you know, and I don't want to. Right. Ha- and you have to be able to go there in their worldview. You have to be able to like yeah. show how their worldview is inconsistent. And in so far as you're doing that, like, I guess you could call that common ground. Yeah. Well, we yeah. know but then you you're gotta, taking, you, you know that they do know certain things. Exactly. They know that they're like, they have this innate knowledge, right. uh, you know, what yeah. the epistemology, the properly basic knowledge about God. And so they believe in justice and they justice. believe that there's like some standard yeah. of what we should and shouldn't do. And why would you other? pretend like they don't right. for and the sake of like trying to get them to believe that abortion is wrong? Yeah. Common ground can be used as a place to, like you said, show them their inconsistencies of their worldview, but then you can't end on common ground. You've got to say, here's, so, yeah. okay, so I'll, I'll go from your worldview, show it why it doesn't work. Now here's my worldview and here's how it does work. Yeah. So let's, let's hop off this common ground. That's ridiculous. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Let's, because it's like, here's our common ground. Worldview. Here's our common ground. We both believe justice is a thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the way, like, yep. we should care about human rights. So then let's talk about your worldview and how like it, it completely undermines anything because again, we're a bag of selfish genes just out to propagate ourselves. And like, if we can get further, that's the win. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then, and it's like, that doesn't ever get you human rights. So then let's talk about like the Christian worldview, the image of God and man, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And that mm-hmm. gets you right to the human rights. That, yeah. that you, it's going to get justice. you human rights all the way back. Which is Even a, though the yeah. justice is justice that you don't like all the different pieces of. Which is a very like Vantillian perspective in, in a lot of ways because the point of contact for Van Til was always the image of God and man. Yeah. Like you, if there's common ground, the only way they can stand is if they get off of what they're standing on borrowing, and come over to what you're talking about. Borrowing because of what yeah. they yeah. know in themselves. Yeah. But like the rest of their worldview is such a mess because they're suppressing the truth and their righteousness. Yeah. Yep. The fact that they're standing with us on this is because the image of God is screaming out from within them and they cannot ignore it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so the importance of all this, just just to kind of tie it back to what, what we've been tracking on, is that when I would hear pro-lifers that were teaching and training y'all and stuff, kind of like want to remove this ground. Or even remove, like, that's where we're going, or that's the important thing. I'd also hear something along the lines of, like, God didn't really care much about abortion. Like, he didn't really talk about it in the Bible. Or something like, why are you making, because we were trying to make abolitionism sort of this thing that all Christians everywhere living in a culture that practices child sacrifice should be doing something about it. And you'd kind of be the, fair. I don't know if I ever heard that from like JFA or anything like that, but yeah. you, you were around there for a lot. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, what I yeah, did yeah. is I went and I started reading all these all books these and even yep. from guys who would like write good books, yep. like Christian apologetics books, yep. you would still kind of see like this, uh, you know, like, you know, go with sled. Don't go with you're a sinner. <laughs> like, don't lead with, <laughs> right. you just want to kill your children because you're at aught with God or something. Mm, yeah. Um, and so, cause there's benefit in that. And I was kind of like, man, that's really crazy. It's, it's as though the abortion conversation is like the perfect grounds for talking about the gospel. Oh, yeah, like yeah. people go like, I, I just want to, I don't want to go fight abortion. I just want to go share the gospel. And I'm like, you want to go share the gospel, go talk to someone about abortion. You'll be on the gospel like that. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. You can't, it, it just, it just does it. Not only will you be on the gospel, you'll be on <laughs> the incarnation, the image of God, providential history, what God's doing. Oh yeah. And, and, and just whenever someone would say something like, keep the main thing, the main thing, God doesn't really 
you know, the apostles aren't running around fighting child sacrifice, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, well, oh, wait, what about those early Christians who like literally tear down temples? Like, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're child tearing, sacrifice. they literally yeah. are tearing yeah. down infanticide shrines. They literally yeah. are rescuing children the, from the ones rivers thrown on the wayside in the yeah. Roman world. Like, yeah, the Christians were the ones who were coming and collecting the children who had been literally left to die. They are doing it. Now, yeah. it doesn't happen to always be yeah. the subject of epistles that are about like, making sure that false gospels aren't believed. Right. But this is what Christians were doing because as John said, loving your neighbor is how you demonstrate to the world that you love God. Right. And so I just, when people are saying this, I'm like, man, they're like missing the fact mm. that in sort of providential history, like the one place in our culture where we, we have this evil child sacrifice thing and people are willing to sort of justify murder seems to be the place that God in his providence chose to be the entry into our world. Yep. Like mm -hmm. the gospel itself beginning sort of, I mean, yeah, the gospel itself all the way back to Genesis three, like has God entering the world. Seed of the, the woman. Seed of the woman, the womb of a young unmarried woman who did not choose to be pregnant with a child. It's like, <laughs> The, the 14 year old girl who, uh, you know, like you take the rape conceived, like the woman who's been raped, she didn't choose to be with a child, but all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The thing that that example that the world says, like what Roe v. Wade was ruled on basically yeah, yeah, or, is Mary's situation. Not that she was, she raped, wasn't raped, but, but, but she was young. She was unmarried in a culture where being uh, pregnant out of wedlock is, mm -hmm. is a serious. Oh I mean, yeah. You can Everyone, get so it was so much shame mm -hmm. for her. Yeah. Everyone yeah. thought that she and Joseph were sleeping together. Like, yeah, Mary, you know, yeah. Given, immaculate, or well, not yeah. immaculate, yeah. but like you know, providential conception, whatever. Bodily yeah. autonomy type arguments, like definitely justifying the murder of, of oh, yeah. Jesus, which a lot of. Whatever pressure anyone into. feels yeah. to abort today, yeah. she had. Right. And she and, recognized. And like, God mm -hmm. knows this, and he's choosing that circumstance to be literally the circumstance to come in and redeem murderers. Yeah. Yep. And he's totally justified in all that because Mary understanding, of course, her body is not her own. It's God's Every, God. Yep. God owns everything. She so did it's like, say, mm -hmm. let it be. Yeah. Thy will be done. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I think Catholics kind of over esteem her as like the queen of heaven or whatever, but she's an, I mean, Schaefer, Francis Schaefer, he often said, no, she is an amazing example. She's an amazing woman. I mean, yeah. she, you're, you're sitting there, an angel appears before you and says all this and scripture is just pretty clear. She's like, I right. will be done, yep. you know? And, uh, and when then, she knew how much she would suffer for it. Yeah. yeah. And the same with Joseph. And then of course, right there at the incarnation, once you have sort of the evil sort of Pharaohs, the Herod, you mm -hmm. know, oh, figure, yeah. what's he doing? Killing babies. Exactly. Just oh, like, yeah. just back with Moses, you got a redeemer coming from Israel. What's he doing? Killing babies because yep. Satan hates the seed of woman who is prophesied to come. And so, yep. and so the way that Satan blasphemes is by yeah. coming after the image bearers who are in the same place where God became man. Yeah. It's so, like, he's literally like in his hatred for God and for the incarnation for like Christ, yeah. you know, the King coming to crush his head. He goes after the image bearers who are there because that's the best he can yeah. do right now. And I, and I, and I remember back in like 2010 and 11, this oh, was yeah. just like, like oh, yeah. blowing my mind. Cause I'm like, okay, you got all these people kind of fighting abortion and all this kind of stuff. And it seems like abortions happen pretty early on. And it's like, there's a, uh, you know, cause I was a historian of science and medicine and stuff. And so I knew about herbal abortifacients and stuff all the way back. And I'm like, I think like all this concern about like post 20 week thing. I'm like, I think that Satan, I just remember thinking this. I don't know anything about Satan. I don't, I don't know if I've ever met him or anything like that. I don't know anything about Satan. I can't for sure say I've ever yeah, met him. I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, he's probably got bigger fish to fry or whatever. I don't, I don't, he, I don't know. Yeah. Putts. But that guy, whatever, whoever's doing whatever, I just think they know that the image of God is on man, mm. the moment of conception. And they know, like when they see the zygote in the womb of a woman, it's just like a reminder of what God did mm -hmm. and that they're done and that it, they did not manage to kill him. The whole like dragon waiting to devour the child, not oh, yeah. going to stop. All over Revelation. Yeah. It's just like they failed, but there's such a sort of chaotic animosity towards God like the whole angels long to look into like, why does God love these sinful human beings? Yeah. These mm -hmm. image bearers. Why does he want to restore them? I don't get it. I hate them. I want them killing the, each other at that earlier moment. I was very convinced early on. It's like, you know what? 
I think that Satan likes to kill babies when they're zygotes. Yep. And like, if he can convince us to be killing our children before we even know they exist, that's where he wants us to go. And so without going too conspiratorial in my mind, that's where I was thinking is like, oh man, all these pro-life arguments that focus on like, sort of like when the babies are almost like fully born looking babies and stuff is like, they're, they're, that's true. It's, it's wrong to shed innocent blood whenever there's actual blood. But this sort of like killing children in the place of the incarnation for me, and this and got me in trouble because yeah. at Trinity Baptist Church, you know, I remember getting up on Sanctity of Life Sunday and saying something about the implications of the incarnation for things like in vitro fertilization, thinking, guys, we can't mess around. Oh, yeah. But everyone had been swimming in this sort of like heartbeat fingerprint, you know, when your baby, you know, yeah. has well, the ability to feel pain. A lot of the apologetic uh, center is based around um, what they could be, not what they are. Yeah. It's like sled is all about what they could be, not what they are. Yeah, or it's what they're going to, to be. Something. Like their yeah. genetics are going to make them this thing. Yeah. And it's kind of like, no, if you really get your mind to be wrapped around the image of God is there, mm -hmm. like through like the Morula stage, you know, mm -hmm. like if you, that, and, and that when Satan sees an embryo, he doesn't see like the way that a human, see, like clump of cells. Yeah. He sees Christ has come to destroy death. I hate him, man. <laughs> I hate God and I hate what he did. And so, and that's why there's such a war between the dragon and the seed of woman. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so that whole context, I'm like, wow. Okay. So abortion is the evil of our age. Yeah. Like child sacrifice, whether you're talking about during Moses, during, uh, you know, Christ, his birth, like child sacrifice is this thing from the beginning to the end. And Christians ought to be, in the context of this conversation, bringing the kingdom of God to bear. Yep. And of course you look around and that just wasn't something that was going on. Now yep. we see more of that today, yep. obviously. But, um, so that is the big context wherein we're walking around, <laughs> you know, with my dog. <laughs> right. And I'm like, uh, Oh, Holy night do or whatever. This. I don't know. Yeah. I don't think I said, Oh, Holy night. Maybe. I don't yeah. Know. I think, I think it was like in the following week or whatever, you know, something like that. But, so, so, but so it was so, kind of like, Josh, you got to write a new verse that brings the incarnation to bear against the evil yep. of our age. Just like they brought the image of God and the incarnation against the evil of theirs. Yep. Yep. So we get Josh. So here we go. Oh, Holy here night. we go. Here's the overall lyrics, right? So the first verse was a retranslation, right? Which, if you compare with the other stuff, is closer, not perfect. Returning to the original. Right. It, at least, like, hey, let's bring Christ back into this and, and actually have some concepts that mean something here. Right. Yeah. So um, the lyrics are, oh, holy night. And, and feel free to ask questions as you're like, you know, we're reading something and you're like, what, what is that? Or yeah. why did you write that? Or yeah. It's like, oh, holy night, the eve of restoration. Tonight, the pure Lamb of God has come to earth, born to erase our Father's imputation. So erase the stain of original yeah. sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? you, got the, you got that like, back in there. Yep. To cleanse the church and at last to break the curse. O glorious hope, our God as babe dependent has come to bear our sin upon the tree. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. it's like our sin, like he's bearing it. Yeah, but the whole our God is babe dependent is that that idea of the incarnation, the sort of like emptying himself mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. become like us in all things. Yep. I do think it's good to think about yet. Yeah, Jesus was a very fragile human being yeah. in the cold of night being wrapped in, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. like, you know, the, the way they wrapped little lambs in that yep. area. Yeah. Uh, swaddling clothes. And it's a very it's focused it seems to be very focused on the worth of the child and the innocence of the child and the sin of the people that mm -hmm. made this yeah. child's right. eventual death necessary. Not yeah. we're so worthy and yeah. we're so we beautiful. We just needed to know how worthwhile we were. <laughs> yeah. like, like he's come <laughs> to be born among us, live perfectly yeah. and die for our sins. Mm -hmm. yeah. You got that back in there. So, yeah. so you, uh, I don't think that uh, Celine Dion's going to be singing this version of it, but it's a more one active. of these days. One, one of, of these, these days, days. Right. yeah. Maybe her, maybe her daughter. I don't know. Yeah, um, Dat post mail. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> fall on your knees, behold your just atonement. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's which a, was originally word, in there, right? And it's like the just atonement, like the just and the justifier propitiation. Like it's, yeah. it's hard when you're trying to rewrite words to like actually 
you've got to rhyme and you've got to have the right rhythm. And yep. sometimes it's just not quite as clean as like just plugging it in exactly like it was in the original. Yep. But it's like the justice of right. the atonement. Yep. Await your deliverance and you have both yep. your justice. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Christ has come, his people to redeem. The Christ has come, his people to redeem. Yeah. So that's like the first verse that's trying to kind of recapture what it actually was and, and how it really was like Christmas is about the redemption that Christ is bringing into the world. It's not yeah. about like a mystically beautiful baby. It's about like yeah. really like he came to die. He was yeah. born to rescue which us from in, sin. Which in the nativity story, the shepherds and eventually the wise men are coming to see the king, their exactly. deliverer. And that's what's prophesied. And they're not, it's not just sort of like this, this, Oh yeah. You know, Christ child, which is, is why he got gold, frankincense and myrrh yeah. because it's like gifts worthy of the King. Right. Yep. Like what you would offer before God. And then like the ointment for his burial. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, okay. so, so it's it. So you definitely have got that back in there. Yeah. Okay. Now we've got Christmas, true Christmas. Yep. And then the first verse, here's your completely new. Yep. Yeah. So the second verse is like, um, a lot of scripture throughout and a lot of yeah. concepts, but trying to kind of, talk about things in a semi fresh way to where people are like, Oh wait, that's a concept. I hadn't even really thought about like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is the part yeah. that I'm talking about. We need to get people yeah. thinking about yeah. the incarnation in, in light of abortion and all so, that. So, so new infant born, like born within the womb of his mother, Mary mm-hmm. named from the womb of Mary, the yeah. reference to Isaiah 49, one, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, the long awaited, right. Prophesied, foretold all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yet unexpected. Yeah, Son. because literally and, an angel shows up and is like, "Hey, Mary, you're going." Yeah, and, and it's like, mm-hmm. "What?" And for people who you know know the history here, there's been quite a while since God's done something. Yeah, I mean, we like have four hundred years. Yeah, we had that whole Maccabees period. So yep. there's just not really. I mean, it's sort of like almost out of nowhere. You got yep. the people; they're like living under Roman rule. There's not really been anything going on, yep. and mm-hmm. Gabriel shows up to Mary. Oh yeah, and again, I guess you had John the Baptist before then, but partially because we're making we're drawing the connections with the unplanned, pr- you know. Yeah. Children, yeah, yeah. And like the un, yeah, like the unexpected nature of it is like that's who Jesus was, yeah. Um, though in disgrace, like the shame that she and Joseph would experience, yeah. Unique begotten bearing, yeah. with joy the virgin conceives the holy one, yeah, which is beautiful. Mm-hmm. All fruit of womb, which is actually this is this is a reference to uh, Luke one forty one through forty five. Like it's really really good text. I'll probably read the whole thing. All fruit of womb who bear God's image, praise Him. And say and and save from death those babes to slaughter led, referencing like rescuing those yeah. being led away to slaughter. Like that. and and literally at the time, res you know referring to like there's a strong what they used to call Coventry carols, uh-huh. right? Just it's pretty sick. Our world is that sinful mm-hmm. that our governmental leaders are killing children. Oh yeah, leading children to the slaughter. Oh yeah. No, there's because strong echoes enmity. of like the slaughter of the innocents yeah, uh, with Herod. Yeah, with, which, uh, all the children under two in the region getting murdered. Yeah, and Jesus just barely escaping. Yeah, you know, like leaving to Egypt, and he's entered that world yep. in that situation yep. to redeem it because he could have just destroyed us, but he he said back at the whole flood thing that he wasn't going to do that. Yep, mm-hmm. yep. And so, uh, and then of course you have leap. Leap for joy, which is like this moment with him and John the Baptist, of yep. John the Baptist leaping for joy in his mother's womb. Yep. I, I do want to read that text because it's like I was reading back through this stuff and I was like, oh, I took a lot from that. Yeah. So it's like, and when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Yeah. And it's like, that's, it's like Jesus is referred to the being the fruit of her womb and all that. And yeah. so it's like trying to, trying to, trying to basically hijack from plagiarized scripture. And yeah, and well, no, it's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this the pre yeah. you get the idea of the preeminence of Christ, the yep. firstborn of creation, the mm-hmm. only begotten. Son. Yep. Oh yeah. So firstborn of new creation reference to Colossians one fifteen. you know, mm-hmm. um, abolish death. Second Timothy one ten is an awesome yep. like text <laughs> about all this, <laughs> uh, where it's like, that's very clear what he does. Yeah. But then sometimes you ask people, why did Jesus come? Mm-hmm. And they'll, they'll usually say, to save sinners. Yes. <laughs> 
but to abolish, like scripture is very clear. He yeah. came to abolish death. Yep. To destroy every work of the devil. Yeah. And yep. the final enemy is death. It's, it's throughout the epistles. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, and then what that text actually says and uh, talking about Christ Jesus, which now has been made manifest through the appearing of our savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It's like yeah. literally Jesus comes to abolish death. Well, there's a weird, like, how do we imitate him? And it's like, of course, in, in terms of like human ways of doing things, many things are like types and shadows and many yeah. things like, okay, I should love my wife so that I represent the mystery that is like Christ loving the church. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And bearing the image of God, like at core, even though a lot of people talk about like, oh, it's about, you know, having a will or having a mind having or reason. like what, what part the of ability is to the paint. image of God It's like, yeah. no, no, no. Being the image of God means like we're not going to make graven images and like these idols because God has made essentially his graven images, like the, the representations of what does he yeah. look like and who is he like yeah. that are humans. Yeah. And so we're made to like Go image reflect God. all the aspects of his characteristics and all the aspects of in and, and yeah. that is what glorifies him and tells the world about him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's like that he actually came in the flesh. So we should demonstrate that in the way you live and love one another. Yeah. So even the work to like abolish death and like the yeah. murder of innocent preborn children in our culture. Yeah. In part, that's like us trying to imitate Christ. Yeah. And yeah. that's, that was the astounding thing. It's yeah. kind of like, you've got this constant child sacrifice every minute of every day going on all across America and Christians don't seem to like see it as an affront to God. Oh yeah. And as a front to their neighbors. It's like this really deeply sacrilegious exactly. gross thing. And of course, yes, it's covered up. It's not like a Moloch with burning hands. It's all it's oh, yeah. all it looks medical. sterile. It looks like but procedural. Once, but once you know what it is. But the spiritual reality is literally like go to the high places and offer your children up yeah. so that you have like prosperity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and your so fields produce grain. I can't die for the sins of the world or abolish death. But mm -hmm. as someone who's been reborn to live and remaining here to serve God, yep. I ought to be at war with things like child sacrifice. Oh, yeah. That Christians weren't just sort of um, automatically drawn. I, would, I mean, I didn't say it. Sometimes I said that I said it. But I, you look at someone and you're like, something is deficient with your gospel. Yep. Because you say something like, listen, I don't want to fight abortion. I just want to get people saved. If they get saved, then they'll fight abortion. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you're like, are you saved? Because you're telling me that you don't want to fight abortion. Yeah. And it's like, man, once I've been redeemed and I'm I'm now walking in the light against the darkness. Oh yeah. Push back the darkness. You know, I've been adopted, so now I need. To, you know, it just seems so natural to yep. go to war with abortion. Mm -hmm. Um. And you know, just to get it all captured. Oh yeah. Well, and, and there's a there's a piece that people miss. Of like, there's a lot of pieces people miss, but it's like Proto Evangelion, right? Like the first telling of the gospel in the Bible is talking about the crushing the head of the serpent. Is mm -hmm. that the whole story? No. But is that part yep. of the story? A central part of the story? Yes. So, but then you have this other reference where the God of peace shall soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Underneath your feet, like yeah, yeah. the church's feet. Like we are to crush the head of the serpent and any of his demonic em emissaries and like, you know, yeah. minions. So when Moloch is busy doing his business in our yep. society, like we ought to crush Moloch in yeah. the same way that we like, we're to crush the head of Satan under our feet. Yeah. So it's, it's a weird. And, and so, and, th and that is all wrapped up. I mean, we are very conscious at the beginning. We're like, this yep. is a church driven obligation of the church is to go to war with these things. Right. And so, you know, you look at some of the early, AHA posters and stuff, yep. you know, I remember making them and then Catholics would freak out and they'd be like, no, 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 that's Mary's supposed to be crushing the head of the serpent. And I'm always like, oh, <laughs> what? Well, like, I don't know what's going on here, but it's kind of like he redeemed you. He, Christ appeared to destroy the works of darkness and then of he the devil. Yeah. Yeah. And of the devil. And he redeemed people so that they would do his work and be his body after he left. And yep. that he would be with us right. and the Holy Spirit would be with us. Which is like, so go it, do the not things say, that he's doing. So therefore we should, you know, abolish abortion without any reference to the gospel. It's like, no, no, no. So we should abolish abortion by the power of the gospel yeah. and proclaim to people, because it's the only hope we have, and proclaim to people like, you have done so wickedly. It is sin. You have sacrificed your child to Moloch. Yeah. But there is redemption. The king yeah. has died so that you could be reconciled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we get to proclaim abortion is child sacrifice. It is murder that there is forgiveness for the sin of murder yep. because we know God who forgives murderers. Yep. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that I think you actually capture that. You're like, you know, this is he enters the womb to redeem to destroy death. Yeah. You yeah. know, and to and to and to save from death mm-hmm. those babes to slaughter later. Oh, yeah. And yeah. actually using all of like historical child sacrifice throughout the Old Testament to amplify the heinousness of the cross. And in that yeah. you can see totally. how what a beautiful thing God has done for us. But looking at the very concept of destroying children and thinking that is such a disgusting thing for someone to do yeah. that, and then for God to offer up His own Son for Jesus to willingly do that, and, and put the principalities and powers to open shame. Yeah, is what Paul says. Mm-hmm. Yep, <laughs> and yeah. it's like just completely saying, "I won." <laughs> it was like, yeah, yeah. Cause he, guys. cause he conquers yeah. death and he brings new life. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's not one of these things where we think that, okay, once you become saved, you're no longer going to die yep. or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But it is that Christ has destroyed, like death is the enemy. Mm-hmm. It enters the world because of sin. Mm-hmm. So Christ is it like, you know, it says that it's the final enemy. Mm-hmm. Like he is putting, but like Christians, as we're left here, like, you know, you get saved. You don't just sort of go up to heaven. Right. You're like left here. You have to serve him. Well, what did he come to do? Destroy the works of the devil. Mm-hmm. And you're like abortion. What is that? That's the work of the devil gets all the way back into yep. what we've been talking about. Oh, yeah. I mean, Satan oh, yeah. hates the gospel. He hates the incarnation. He doesn't get it. The redemption of human beings. Yep. The humans mm-hmm. are made in the image of God and angels aren't. I think he just hates God and what God elected to do. Yep. And so, yes, he is at war with human beings. Oh, yeah, but then, but then let's go a step further, arena. even within the gospel, So there's because there's so many different levels and, and yeah. aspects, whatever. But it's like when we were talking about like the early days of abolition, it was like yep. we, can't, we can't separate out like agitation and assistance. Yeah. Like the two modes have to be wedded together. You yeah. can't have like the person who's in front of the, the signs of the, the aborted fetus at odds with the person who's running like a crisis pregnancy yeah, center, which we were very, like, you know, trying to assist. Very with, loud like, about. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like, we're very deliberately trying to say, no, like, no, those should be the same people, the church. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, uh, but part of that is because he abolished death by adoption, like yeah. by adopting us while we were helpless, while we were in our sin, mm-hmm. Christ died for us. But like but Ephesians one five is like he predestined us to adoption as his sons, mm-hmm. and yeah. there's all kinds of stuff like in Hebrews of like joint heirs and like, and then and that's kind of where it goes is like, the son adopts wretched foes as royal sons, yeah. and it's like he doesn't, he doesn't, you know, question whether or not he should call us brothers, right? It's like through the death of the son, we are adopted into the family of God. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I do. I want to read Hebrews two ten through yeah. eighteen because it 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 ties a bunch of concepts to de- together. Yeah, but um, it's it's such an it is a super important uh, passage, mm-hmm. not only for this conversation but for just for abolitionism oh, yeah. in general. For it is it was Hebrews two ten. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect. So he by as the father. Uh, the founder of their salvation is Christ. The mission make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering Mm -hmm. for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified. So Christ who sanctifies us and us who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers Mm -hmm. saying, I will. And this is quoting uh, old Testament. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, Behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, so us, the children, share in his flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. Like he took on human flesh and blood Yeah. that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Yeah. And deliver all those who through the fear of death were sub- subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a faithful, a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation, wrath-bearing sacrifice for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And so it's like even that last piece of like, he was tempted. Yeah. 
and we're talking about a sin that you have been tempted by the devil, you've given into, right? He can sympathize with your weakness, but he also says, because I was tempted and overcame, become like me, follow so me. Can you. I will empower you by my spirit so that you no longer have to continue in the practice of something like abortion or yeah. something like the immorality that led to the abortion. Yeah. Like all, all this any stuff. Any and every kind of sin, but yeah. it, there's like a culminating, I mean, yeah. that people are so lost and so separated from who they ought to be in Christ that yep. they are killing their own children. Yep. And so whenever we get to the point where it's like, you're talking to someone on a college campus or online or something like that, and they're trying to justify the murder of their own children. Mm-hmm. Mm. They are devoid of this redemption. They are not walking in the light of God. They're, they're, they're lost. Mm-hmm. So why in the world would you withhold the one thing that's going to get them on the track to give them the yeah. ability to fight that temptation, you know, to stand up to whatever a culture or their, you know, their situation is. So in a certain sense, the whole withholding the gospel in those conversations is like leaving them incapable of mm. fighting abortion. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter what they believe. If they are not adopted and reborn, mm-hmm. they're not at odds with death. Yep. Yep. And yeah. so we, uh, we learn to do the same. Yeah. We try to be imitators of God. And which so is, we seek which to is where you go. Death and when, adopt children and like all this, you know, like, yeah. And, and, and then yeah. it gets back to the original, truly he taught us to love one another. Exactly. Yep. His law is grace, his gospel is peace. You know, so truly he taught us like Christ did come among us and do all these things, but he also taught us how to love one another. Oh yeah. All of the, I mean, the Beatitudes. He was preaching his kingdom. He was preaching. This is, I, you are not able to be this way, but through me, you can be this way. You know, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, all that kind of stuff. Bigger, bigger thing. Yeah. So then we did, you know, third verse kept it the same. And then the last kind of refrain is like weaving all three of the verses together. All on your knees. Where it's like, behold, our just atonement, who broke our chains so that we would call him Lord. Because that really is the purpose. He, he freed us from slavery to our old master, that we might be slaves to a new master. Yeah. Um, and then he calls unwanted souls his very own. And I love, like, it's pretty graphic, but, like, I love the Ezekiel 16, like, imagery about, like, you were lying in your blood and mm-hmm. I came and I like rescued you. And mm-hmm. it's like just the level of like pathetic. It's like you had just been given yeah. birth and like, you're just there and a baby and like, you can't do anything and you were left for dead. Mm-hmm. And it's like, that's who we are. We're so pathetic. Like yeah. we're like so helpless <laughs> yeah. and so in need. And yet he rescues us. So why wouldn't we turn around and do the same in a physical way yeah. for those in, you know, it, why wouldn't we image that? Image and that. how do you image that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> he a abolished lot. death. What do you do? You set yourself yep. at odds with death. And when you're not doing it, everyone, so the verses that talk about how um, that they would be say your good works and uh, glorify. Praise your, glorify your, God, your father who's in heaven, you see Christians nowadays and they're trying to earn the respect of the world and things like that. But their works don't reflect what Jesus did. They don't rescue orphans. They don't go out to the places of death. They preach sermons that are devoid of scripture and they don't do anything. They just yeah. continue on in this in this kind of dead mm-hmm. way. Um, yeah, that's totally. the best way you can you can image God is rescuing those who are being yeah. led away yeah. to death. We, we must, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I think and I so so I think that I think a lot of our heart from the early days on is to see the church, like I always say, like the people of God, the body of Christ, yeah. the church of the living God, sort of come to an understanding of just what they have in the gospel, what they have as being redeemed, adopted, left here in a world that is just awful, murderous, awful world, but we have the gospel. Okay, go church, bring the gospel into conflict with these evils. Yeah. It's, I mean, child yeah. sacrifice is the very easy one to see, but there's many evils. There's all sorts of idolatry and evil. But I think that the idea was, can we get people to understand this? And so we did it through song. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, we want to, in this, you know, we're going to kind of move some things around and let you play the song, because if we can get people to begin singing, Oh, Holy Night, as an abolitionist hymn, as a truly, you know, you know, just yeah. biblical 
him that brings just the work of what he did in the incarnation, the work of the gospel into just sort of the direct conversation. Yeah. Um, like you know, I, I wrote this we'll song for the church. Age. Yeah. I, like I wrote the song for the church to be able to sing what is true, mm-hmm. like to be able to take these abstract and not abstract, but these like theological truths about Christ and his reality, apply them to this issue, yeah. apply them to like what love your neighbor really looks like today. Yeah. And, and help it like get in our bones, you know, and like get in our souls oh, yeah. you by, got, by singing it and repeating it. You, know, like you got 300 people sitting in some oh, yeah. uh, vaulted room and singing this song and thinking to themselves, whoa. It's pretty awesome. Whoa. Yeah, we should, <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Babes to slaughter lead, you yeah. know, like, I mean, yeah. let's go fight this. And so. It's only happened a couple times, but it's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I've seen it. We, I mean, we sing it. doesn't matter if it's like middle of March you know, yeah. abolitionist conference. We it's usually not just say, Christmas. Like, it's <laughs> not the incarnation. You, you should be But I'll sing joy to the world all the year around too. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's another good one. You know, uh, another good gospel, of the kingdom song, but so let's let you play. Um, Oh, Holy night. Um, so people, so there's a, they get to hear it as it's sung. And then also, so we'll have a, have a good recording of it. And and the idea is we want people, we'll, we'll publish the lyrics to the podcast. And we want people to sing this. You know, if like you're, if you're a music minister or a pastor or something like that, um, this is one way that you can sort of disciple your congregation or your Bible study or your group or the people that you're, that you're reaching to, um, get them to sort of begin sort of embracing, um, sort of a very, um, practical form of bringing Christianity into conflict with the culture of death that we find ourselves in. So yeah, let's listen to Oh Holy Night and, uh, all right. Then we'll we'll get back and kind of conclude the show. Let's do it. Oh, holy night, the eve of restoration tonight, the pure. Lamb of God has come to earth Born to erase Our Father's imputation To cleanse the church And at last to break the curse Oh glorious hope Our God is bathed Dependent has come to bear our sin upon the tree. Oh, fall on your knees. Behold, you're just a torment. The Christ has come. to redeem the Christ has come his people to redeem new infant born named from the womb of Mary the long-awaited yet unexpected son. Though in disgrace, unique begotten bearing, with joy the virgin conceives the Holy One. All fruit of womb, who bear God's image, praise Him and save from death those babes to slaughter led. Leap, leap for joy, firstborn of new creation, abolish death. Adopting helpless souls The Son adopts wretched foes As royal sons 
truly taught us to love one another. His law is grace and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we let all within us praise his holy name Christ is the Lord oh praise his name forever he is Thanks for that. That that's awesome. I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, thanks. The thought that you would have Christians all over the planet singing that version, like as we kind of joked, like making it hard for secular artists mm-hmm. to sing "Oh Holy Night" again because they couldn't just sort of, you know, be vaguely Christian. Hijack our holiday. Yeah, <laughs> you know, just like let's let you know. What is the, we used to say it all the time. It's like, um, to sing nativity songs is to be in conflict with the culture of death. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that in every congregation, because let's face it, there there are people killing their children in solid Christian churches. Mm -hmm. It's not being preached about in some places. And so... They're not Wh- thinking whether about it be it. the the fetal stage or the embryonic stage, yeah, that's oftentimes, more popular. Yep. Often, I mean, there was something really sickening. I mean, you know, like early on when you become an abolitionist, you have these like nightmare type dreams about abortion because mm-hmm. you're seeing all this abortion imagery and stuff. Sure. And I just remember thinking about how many like married women in like Baptist churches were like sitting in a Sunday service somewhere as like a little image bearer was sort of like. N- failing to implant because of certain things they had done to their bodies that had made the mucus lining in their, in their womb unhospitable Yeah, and kind of thinking just like, Oh my gosh, like, like abortive patient, abortive control patient birth stuff, controls yeah. right. and you know, IUDs and stuff. Right. And so I was like, man, they're like people singing songs to God, you know, in churches all across this yep. land while abortion is happening in their womb. And they're going to go home and they've just, and they're not thinking about it because it's not being preached about. And if, if it is like on a sanctity of life sermon, it's, it's all wrapped up in sort of this later term stuff. And so, but just the idea that there would be congregations singing this version mm-hmm. and really coming t- to grips with the reality of the creator of the cosmos becomes the size of a single human cell and chooses the place where we justify murder to be the like entryway into yeah. the world to redeem murderers yeah. is just 
fantastic. So I think I, I think we hope and pray yep. that, you know, I love your version. I love to listen to you, you know, play My and crooning. sing. Yeah. I think you should do it more, <laughs> you know? I'm trying to, man. I uh, The problem was uh, we did all, we started all this stuff, and then I started selling houses because I had to figure out organizations yeah, gotta, so yeah. that I could be the organizational guy behind for the States. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> and you got to feed, your, you gotta feed your yeah. kids and stuff. But, make sure you survive. But, I mean, uh, I would love to hear. Yeah, like <laughs> if you didn't do that, I'd probably be dead. Yeah. But I, I would love to, you know, hear, you know, like see YouTube filling up with different artists playing their, their renditions. And oh, yeah. There are some, but, um, you know, different congregations, people singing it. Mm. I'd love that so too. Hopefully, yeah. it'll catch on. Yeah. Hopefully, we get a really good recording and get it out there. Yep. No, and, and I'll, I mean, I, I want to do a lot more than I have. Obviously, like yeah. since this one was like my third song, but there's been a lot of music since. Yeah, you've done <laughs> for a lot of ups and downs. You've done a full movement. album that's still yeah. on the same topic. <laughs> right. Yeah. So there is. Uh, I've got actually like three albums you can find. Um, the we- the best website to go to would be the snowisred dot com. That'll link you directly to uh, the Snow is Red album. But on that same website, you can find my artist page. It's <laughs> crushing that as serpent. Treading or robberous. Treading or robberous. A snake eating its tail. O U R O B O R O S. It's hard hey, to Sam, if, Just do the snow is red dot com. Put it right there. That was coming. Treading or robberous. <laughs> 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 type it. Type it right. That's right. Type it right here. <laughs> there it is. It's there right go. there. Thank you, Sam. You're welcome. That was great. Treading or robberous dot com. Um, cause you can get links to my mind. not just snow is red, but also, yeah, there are two other albums I've got out so far. One of them was a Christmas album. The Christmas album. Behold your God. Behold, is it really good? There's also a number of other original songs on that album. The, uh, there's one, especially, uh, there's on a couple topic. that are just kind of traditional Christmas songs, whatever. Yeah. And then, uh, there's another one that is, um, it's the w- music from the wake up church conference. Right. And so that has like three or four. It has Oh Holy Night. It has you know three or four other original songs. I am Alicia by yep. you and Garrison. Yeah, I, I changed three words and then I put my name on the title. It's like, <laughs> sorry, William. that song that sorry, Garrison, Garrison wrote that yeah. you sang. That's right. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, but I do like. There's so much that hasn't been put out there. The the plan in the long term is to get more active with the stuff. I show up at all the conferences and play stuff, but I really want to start putting yeah. putting albums out and stuff. I feel like I finally. Um, really got a vision for what a new album could be uh, that it's, it's interesting because a lot of people are like, it, like, I think it's a really important moment for people to get a context for where the movement's at and understand the history of the movement. Yeah. And I realized like, Oh, that's how all my songs fit together is they were written chronologically through the movement at yeah. different key points. See, I'm going to take Those a lot of credit issues. here. Yeah. Cause, cause I can't, you know, you know, I, I'm not good. Yeah, you know, I, I can't sing, and so it's kind of like. But I understand music's super important and powerful. Uh-huh. So every time there'd be like a new conference or something, it's like, it's like hey, hey, Josh, hey, Josh, we're gonna you? do a petition initiative to put abolition on the ballot, and we're gonna do this, and we're gonna. Oh, it's gonna be great. Can you sing? Can you write a song for it? <laughs> Can it sound a little bit like the Hunger Games song? And then see, I I feel like I got a lot. I don't know. I, I, I think I brought ideas to you. Anyway, whatever. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm just trying to revise the history to put myself <laughs> in the right. middle. You are such a revisionist. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. No, and I so, just remember, though, thinking, Kali, we need a song. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. there have been times where I'm like, we need a song, and you're like, well, I'm so, I'm sorry. I've, I've got to. I've got I to, have to sell these five more houses. Yeah. Like, I just, I'm not yeah sure. we're, we're not going to be I able to start. pay the rent. <laughs> so hopefully a lot of that yeah. stuff will fall in place. Well, and, and so – what I want to do is is have an evening where I recount a lot of the history and give a lot of the context. And it's a lot of yep. like talking and explaining and then playing a song that was like that. These moment. key songs yeah. along the last and, and, decade and help tell the whole narrative and story of like the movement as we've seen it. Uh, but, but yeah. by, by weaving together these songs. So I think it's yeah. gonna be really good. What got to figure out some specifics on how to yeah. get it done. So but, something to look mm. forward to. Yeah. Uh, hopefully in the next so. six months of a year. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for being on this episode of the Liberator Podcast. Yeah, yeah. thanks for I having me, guys. I think we did a lot of things, and hopefully we covered a lot more ground than we planned to. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like, okay. hey, the gospel really mattered to us from day one because it's like yeah. the center of our being and everything that yeah. And I think, in the world. and I yeah. think sometimes when you get so narrowly sort of like on like how does this play out and apply politically, yeah. right? This stuff never goes right. away. It it's is like, the point. It plays out cosmically it's the power. and political stuff is a context within the cosmos. Yeah. <laughs> and like, because of that, we engage on that. Yeah. yeah. And the gospel mm-hmm. is many things, but it is definitely political. <laughs> like the that's why the King, <laughs> that's why King Herod wanted to kill 
Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> so without going back All into right. two hours of this stuff, thanks for listening to the Liberator mm-hmm. podcast and tuning in. And hopefully in the future, we'll have Josh back, uh, some future Be projects. Fun. So. Mm-hmm.